selling your game in, in an optimal, optimal manner. I'm not going to say that we've made the best selling game in the universe, but we've made a decent selling game, and so I just wanted to share a few tips. And uh, since it's the last talk of the day, I think we'll have quite a bit of Q&A time at the end, if you're content sticking to water that long. <laughs> so first, uh, Mike, my name is Briauten Sjörgeirsson, and it's... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's getting late. Um, it's still the worst name in the industry, and uh, well, obviously, if you name your, if you name that, it's no, uh, it's no wonder that you actually name your company Image and Form, which uh, sounds like it has nothing to do with games. Um, I was going to say, take a picture now of this screen if you if you want to have these slides later on, or if you want to ask me something. Or you can meet me at Pony Bar and we can exchange, uh, not body fluids, but <laughs> we can exchange business cards at least. So um, here we go. I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to say also that these slides that I'm presenting here are not an absolute truth. It's the way we consider things at image and form. And uh, if you disagree, just shout out afterwards, please. And uh, I'm going to talk a little bit first about what we've done at Image and Form. How many people here have heard of Image and Form at all? Oh, great. A lot of new faces, potential customers in the audience. So in, uh, for the longest time, we were actually a work for hire studio. And we made a lot of edutainment games for PC and Mac on CD-ROM. We made a shitload of money that way. We made tons and tons of cash making other people's games, just charging by the hour, basically. But when we had made 25, I kid you not, 25 games in the same edutainment series, I was really worried that like, not only the best people in the studio, but everyone, including uh, like the janitor was going to resign from boredom. So when the App Store came about, we decided that this is our chance. We have to make, we have to try to make our own games. And so we made a few really shitty games between 2009 and 2010. And then at the end of 2011, we uh, released a really brilliant game called uh, Ant Hill, which was a real-time strategy game uh, featuring ants being attacked by uh, other various insects. It's a beautiful game. Everybody owns it, of course, in the audience, right? Okay, I'm going to leave you off the hook there. And then in 2013, uh, we released a game called SteamWorld Dig. First on the 3DS, and then it came to all the other platforms that I've listed there. So PC, Mac, Linux, Steam obviously being the biggest, PS4 and Vita, Wii U, and then Xbox One. Has anyone here in the audience played that game? All right, someone down there played it twice, thank you. <laughs> right, it's, uh, so what it is, it's a mining platform adventure game. Uh, it's a 2D game, all, all our games are 2D. And uh, it just um, put us on the map, basically, uh, among uh, game developers. The 3DS version came out of nowhere and scored really well, and uh, sold really well, too. And also, uh, I should mention that now we're, we've been a self-publisher then since 2011, and one of one of the biggest tips I can give you is if you have any people in your vicinity, you should really uh, just talk to them and see if you can help each other out with stuff. Uh, who in here is a game developer? Hand up. Well, I'm glad since we're at a game, de <laughs> game development conference. I realized that was a stupid question. Thank you. <laughs> but how many of you sort of cooperate with someone else on uh, on any aspect of game development, any other studio, hand up, please. Excellent. You with a great hairstyle there. Um, who do you work together with? Yeah. Yeah. 
Small Russian studios, thank you. I only thought there were big Russian studios. <laughs> thank you very much. It's, but it's obviously very uh, beneficial, I, I take it. I mean, if you cooperate on stuff that you're not the best at, obviously both studios are going to benefit. I think it's a brilliant idea to, uh, to sort of work together with studios that either live close by or do stuff that is similar to what you do. It's working together with people is free, that's the best part, and it's also quite nice to sort of have a shoulder to cry on when things aren't going so well and sharing tips and so on. We're working to go together with a studio called Zoink Games in Gothenburg and they're, they're about the same size as us, 15-16 people and we can share a lot of uh, PR marketing efforts. It's, it's really helpful. You should do that. Uh, right now, or right now I should say, for the last 22 months we've been working on a game called SteamWorld Heist which I'm, for a while I was inclined to believe that the game was never going to come out, but uh, this fall it's coming. I'm just going to show you a little teaser trailer from that, if that's okay with you. I'm going to show it, even if it isn't okay with you. Let's hope that we have some sound. There. Cheers. <clears throat> I kind of like that uh, thing uh, with teaser trailers. It's a beautiful thing where you put something out, you have no assets ready, and you sort of set out, put out a video that nobody gets to take any information away from. Um, I think that's pretty much the story of Image and Form. We're very much a, a systems company. Graphic artists don't rule our, our studio, so we never have any real cool assets to show um, until the very end. So, <clears throat> selling your games, <clears throat> we all wish that it was this, right? Or doing business in general. Isn't this nice? It's a beautiful image, right? So you just get on one of those escalators, hopefully the one that goes up. Right? And you just stand still and enjoy the ride, and then you're at the top, and everything is just hunky-dory. Or even better, if you had one of these devices, you wouldn't even have to stand and go onto an escalator. You would just stand there and get beamed up to riches and, and stardom. But in reality, it's for every one of us, or <laughs> for Image and Form and studios like it, it's a little bit more like this. Do you, uh, do you feel like this sometimes? Like you're a small kid with a broken arm and you're gonna, it's a really steep staircase and you're gonna fall down and break your neck. Hand up, who feels like that at any point? Thank you, yeah, I'm not alone. <laughs> right, I think that little guy is actually gonna make it. So, talking about selling your games, I first want to talk a little bit about the markets that are out there. Some of them are oceans, some of them are lakes, and some of them are ponds. Let's just get into it. First, is, are you uh, familiar with the concept of a blue versus a red ocean? Okay, so a red ocean is sort of like a finite space, a defined market space, where you have uh, a fixed number of customers or a fixed, num fixed sales volume, let's call it that. So if, you, if you're growing your business 
it's at the expense of someone else, like one of your competitors is going to lose out a little bit. That's a really breakneck sort of uh, market area. Cars, for example, work that way. Uh, games could be sort of seen that way too. If you have like a, a, a powerful th AAA title and you know a competitor is developing something very similar, let's say a racing game, for example. So the number one among the racing game, uh, game publishers they're making a lot of money, but number seven on the list is probably not making that much money. So the idea for us when we were in mobile development was that we felt that it was actually becoming like a red ocean, meaning that there were so many people coming in. Obviously, the number of users was growing like crazy too, but the number of publishers on the App Store was just becoming huge. And it started to feel almost like a red ocean, that you were actually competing. Like, if some game is selling well, your game is going to sell less. And it was a really hard time for us in 2012, because it was sort of shifting from premium games on the App Store towards free-to-play. That's where the scales tipped, and there was no real turning back. So the idea is, how can we sort of expand our market without mooching off someone else? I mean, it, there's nothing wrong in mooching off someone else if, if you're built that way, but we weren't really. We felt that we weren't able to compete on, on mobile on those terms. We just knew too little about free-to-play, and we also felt that we didn't want to make those types of games. So where should we go instead? we decided to take SteamWorld Dig to the 3DS, and the rest of my talk is going to be about that. How can you sort of go away from two congested spaces to maximize your sales? So let's start talking about oceans. The App Store is the big ocean, whether I say it's blue or red or purple or whatever. You have more than 100 billion downloads on the App Store now, and you have more than half a billion user accounts. That's a huge number of users. But there's like 1.8 million apps in total and 400,000 active games. It means the games that are alive today, not, not the games that have been produced to date, but some games have also been taken down. And if you count both games and apps, there are more than 400,000 app publishers. Everybody is out to make a buck. And if you quit, there's going to be 399,999 uh, app publishers. It's still a huge number, whether you're there or not. So it means if there are so many... Does anyone have a fresh figure on how many games are coming out every day for the App Store? Mike? Three million, he says? That's, that's pretty high. I think it's more like 300, actually, Mike. Yeah. Um, 300 a day means, what, over 2,000 games per week. And we have Apple do a few features, like, for example, Game of the Week, etc. But with more than 2,000 games coming out every week, it's, it's a pretty stiff competition. And you can't really always, with every mobile game, expect to be the best of 2,000 games every week. It's not the only feature mechanism that they have, of course, but it, with so many games coming out the whole time, uh, visibility is just bound to be quite low for, for almost all games. Also, on the App Store and on Google Play, we have a, lot, we have a huge number of what I call non-gamers. It's a rude term because it means, it's sort of derogatory. I, I don't mean to be rude towards people by calling them non-gamers, but uh, my mother is one of them. She's a non-gamer in, in a cute sense. She never plays games and she actually thinks I should get a real job and grow up. Yeah. Still, actually. So, but the interesting thing is that whenever me and her play a game of Words with Friends, for example, or Ruzzle, it takes me about seven days to, uh, to come up with a word. 
And she answers back in 10 minutes. And then she calls me and says, can you hurry up, please? And I say, see, Mom, it's like your games is real. Everybody plays games. And she says, no, it's not games. This is recreation. It's, it's like a crossword puzzle. Games is for losers like, like you, my, my no good son. And also, uh, I, I, I mean that free to play can actually compromise gameplay. And what I mean is that definitely not every free to play uh, uh, is applicable to this, but a lot of them are very simplified so that people don't sort of uh, lose interest in the game. They keep, uh, it's, it's a very short reward loop and so on, and there's also a very short distance to the next knock on the shoulder to make you um, uh, pay for some in-app uh, wonderful thing. So that's the App Store. Steam is a lot smaller than the uh, App Store. Everything is small compared to that if you don't count Google Play, and I've actually not used Google Play as an example here. But it's still an ocean because you have 800 million downloads on Steam. And there are now more than 135 million active users. I think active users is defined, thank you for the beer, <laughs> is defined if you have made a purchase within the last three months or so. So it means that it's an immense number of people um, downloading games via Steam. And these people are gamers. My mom wouldn't get an account on Steam. So that's kind of interesting. It's like a huge number of downloads, so many users, and they know what you're talking about when you're presenting your game. But there are more than 5,600 games. Uh, some speakers today would argue that there are more than 6,000 games even. Uh, and there's a huge backlog on Steam. 40% of the downloads haven't been touched yet. Does anyone here have a Steam backlog? Hand up. <laughs> well, you're overrepresenting in here. It's, I'd say that's like 70%. Fantastic. And people are prone to buy when the games are on sale. Which means that however you price your game, you can't really budget uh, for the income on a specific number there, uh, according to that price point, because people are not going to pay that price. And also, the Steam storefront has sort of changed a little bit, even more to focus on the top-selling games. Because it, obviously, it involves interest to promote those games that sell really well. So that means, again, because of the storefront, and also so many new games are coming out, I mean, when, the, when Greenlight was in place and effective, there was a fairly low influx of new games every day. Now it's, it's quite high every day. You had a figure for this, Mike. What was it? Sorry? I don't think it's 10,000 per day. I'd say it's probably more like 10 a day or so. So, uh, yeah. I think your figures are quite off there, Mike. So. 10 new games per day, it's not like the App Store, right, where you have 300 games per day, but 10 games per, per day is still there. I'll, not to quote anyone, but there are nine other developers sort of vying for the attention. And you very rarely get full price. If, it's, if someone is really interested in your game, to get it at the very start. Otherwise, a lot of people know that you are going to lower the price at some point. And so they're sort of waiting it out. And uh, the exposure you have in the store is really, the time is very short. So PlayStation Network and the Xbox Store are two decent sized lakes, I would say. Uh, I actually had to Google these numbers after Mike's talk earlier today, just so I could up him a little bit. It was, the correct figure is now 26 million PS4 units. And there are a little bit more than 4 million Vita units uh, out there. The Xbox Store has around 15 million Xbox One units. There's a question mark because it's not official figures. Uh, Microsoft doesn't disclose that anymore. These lakes are quite interesting because 
people are very interested in games, obviously, on, on PSN and, and, and Xbox. And you get mostly high quality titles. That means that Sony and Microsoft are sort of taking care of that hurdle for the gamer. If the game comes out on PSN and Xbox Store, it's more likely than not, it's a decent game coming out. But you compete with AAA titles on both of the, in both of these lakes. And there are relat relatively few um, titles coming out every year. And more importantly, every user's, user buys a fairly low number of games every year. Also, it's like you're competing with your little sister, sorry, that's rude, with your little brother about uh, um, the console itself because he wants to play his DVD movies on there and so on. And also your parents want to watch old school TV uh, in the living room, which is of course unacceptable, but you sort of have to swallow it. <clears throat> now, the Nintendo 3D, 3DS eShop is <clears throat> it's not an ocean by any standards, it's also a lake. And it's kind of a hidden lake, I, I like to call it, because it's the biggest current generation console, if you want to call a handheld unit a console, uh, with 53 million 3DS units sold today, worldwide. And uh, the people who own a, th a 3DS, obviously there is, there's the occasional uh, er what do you call it? Erroneous purchase where grandma thought that this is what the kids like, so she bought one for the grandkid. But most of these uh, users are actually diehard gaming fans. And um, so there's also uh, there's great uh, loyalty on the Nintendo platform. If you're once a Nintendo fan, you you, don't, you never stop being a Nintendo fan. It means also that like, it's not age-related. You, you, you can be getting Nintendo tattoos in your 50s and so on. It's, that's totally cool. And uh, on the 3DS eShop, I think there is a total of 900 games. And I think that figure is actually quite optimistic. I, I did a search on on the American store, and I find 900 titles, and the European store had 300 titles. I think I sort of chalk it up to Americans boasting a little bit, and Europeans not getting the games that they want, so probably somewhere in between. But that means that there is very little congestion on the 3DS. If you release a game on the 3DS, you will get attention for that game. Uh, and that's speaking from experience. I would call it a hidden lake because, like Mike was saying early today, um, developing for the 3DS is a pain in the ass. It's actually, it's, it's quite difficult in, in, in a few ways. And it's, um, what do you call it? It's hard to sort of decide to do it and hope for a smooth ride. When you, <clears throat> you're up against so much paperwork and so many difficulties, because it's also so very different from all the other platforms. You have the dual screen, you have the, the weak CPU and the low resolution, etc. So you really have to dedicate yourself if you want to um, develop for it. Once you decide to do it, you'll notice that there are a lot of people just hungering for games. Good games, I should say. The drawback is obviously that you're competing with the worst kind of enemy, the platform owner themselves. Like Nintendo is putting out their own games on the eShop. Also, the US and Europe and Japan are really different because of this region lock thing. <clears throat> so, Games that come out in the US don't come out in Europe, etc. That means that the rules are different. You have to do two separate submissions to the US and to Europe if you want to go in, on both territories. And, and the shocker is that only two thirds actually use the eShop, meaning that a lot of Nintendo players are cartridge players. 
it sort of ties in with the kind of people they are. They're beautiful people, obviously. That's, that's, that sounded condescending, the people they are. But it's, they are, they collect stuff. I mean, they love Nintendo stuff. They got, get the figurines, they get the tattoos, and they want the physical product. So a lot of people aren't buying from the eShop. Only two-thirds have accounts. So that means that whenever Nintendo releases one of their games, they're going to hog the best exposure. It's, you can't really argue with that. And there's also a lot of irritation or confusion of what game is coming where. Is it coming out or when, it, when is it coming out? There's not like a universal uh, uh, release date for the games. And with only two-thirds on the eShop means that you actually, the lake is sort of smaller than it looks on the surface. 35 million accounts is your maximum potential. And then you have also the uh, issue of Japan being so different from the West in terms of uh, what sort of games are popular. The Nintendo Wii U eShop is the small pond. It's the same uh, benefits and, uh, and cons as the 3DS eShop, but it's only a fifth the size. I think the figure now is almost 11 million units uh, of Wii U's sold worldwide. And also, like, on PlayStation, you can do a cross-buy thing between your PS4 title and your uh, Vita title, for example. Well, you, you can sort of do that with the Wii U and the 3DS, but not quite. It's, uh, they don't really have those systems in place yet. So the question is, like, you have these oceans, you have these lakes, and you have like this little pond that we call the Wii U. Where do you guys want to swim? Obviously, you don't want to swim near the Copacabana. You, you read about that, right? Like, uh, they're hosting the, uh, the Olympics there, and someone went swimming near the, well, like, uh, scientists went to that beach to sort of test the water quality, and they had one guy test swimming there, and he went into a coma. So it's, uh, yeah, it's a terrible, terrible uh, um, water to swim in. So where do you want to uh, publish your games? Shout it out, please. Everywhere. Everywhere. That's the right answer. That's fantastic. Oh, that was a stupid question. All right. Again. Well, everywhere is, of course, the right answer. I mean, why should you sort of limit yourself? So why are we? I think now that we've sort of established how things are with oceans and lakes and ponds, we sort of have to go over to eggs and baskets to... to uh, explore this further, because that's the point of this thing, to swim as much as we can with our eggs and our baskets. This is how we start out when we make games. We have one egg, <clears throat> and we aim for one basket with that egg. <clears throat> now that's just an analogy, I mean I don't, it's just a figure of speech, I don't mean like real eggs and baskets, of course, because one egg equals one game, and one basket equals one platform. So we start with one game and we think, shit, we gotta make it. Where are we gonna put it? Are we gonna put it on Steam? Are we gonna put it on mobile? Are we gonna make it for the 3DS? How should we do this? And then we make this Steam game. And it's, it's working out quite well, so we put out more games on Steam or on mobile, and it's gotta be good eggs. Like, if you make rotten eggs, nobody wants to buy it. Um, and so we sort of stick to, these, to this one platform that we know, because it's really convenient. <clears throat> it's the same tech the whole time. We know how to develop mobile games. We know how to make PC games, for example. And the community, we already established a community there, so we're talking to the same people and say, guess what? We're coming out with a new game. But making new games the whole time is kind of expensive or it's relatively expensive, I should say. And that basket that looked so nice in the beginning, it, it can sort of change, right? It's, all of a sudden, it's kind of too small to fit your, your egg, or like, 
that basket, there are so many other eggs there and they don't belong to you. Who's hogging your basket? And obviously there's like the old truth about all eggs in one basket, right? It's, uh, I really wanted to use this analogy because it makes me seem wise and stuff. Because this is something that my parents told me when I was young. It's like, son, don't put all your eggs in one basket. In the beginning, we go out and buy eggs, and we go looking for a basket. And then we realize that they're just using an analogy, a figure of speech. So what we can do is we can ref define this old truth of like putting all the eggs in one basket. Instead, we can put that one egg in a lot of baskets. Because we're digital, and we can copy everything as much as we want. That is the new blue ocean that I'm talking about, that I started talking about in the beginning. You see how it all kind of ties together? It's like, because now so many platforms are similar, if you think about it. I mean, a 3DS works more or less exactly the same as a PC if you hook a, a controller to that PC. And obviously, a, a PS4 is very similar to, um, to an Xbox One, etc. Those button controls make them all more or less the same. And compared to development, porting games to all the platforms is really cheap. And if you combine all these swimming spaces, I should say that there is like a watershed there with mobile games on one side and all the other platforms on the other side. Just because of the input difference, mainly I would say. It's really hard to make a game that fits every platform out there. It can obviously be done. A lot of games work beautifully all across the board. But if you have a game that doesn't, then putting all these other platforms together makes for really healthy swimming. <clears throat> it also leaves you in charge of what you do. Because if you decide to go for tons of platforms, um, then you don't have to release your game on all platforms at once. In fact, I actually think it's detrimental. I think it's much better to sort of space it out over time. This is what we've employed at Image and Form. We've decided when we, after Antil in 2012, when it was getting very congested, we decided that we had to leave mobile for a while. And we didn't know where to turn. We had one email address at Nintendo, and that sort of made the difference for us. That's, that decided what platform we made SteamWorld Dig for first. And uh, we had no idea at that time that we were going to release it for almost every other current generation platform. But when we realized that we actually had a, a semi-hit game, it made all the sense in the world to sort of learn how to port to all the different platforms and take the game out across to as many gamers as possible. So we started on the 3DS because we had an email address. That's a really lame um, reason for it. But it sort of, for us, it worked out quite well because the 3DS is the weakest platform. We released the game there, and when it comes out, when it came out in HD uh, on PC and uh, PlayStation, Xbox, Wii U, etc., the reviews got even better without us really touching the game in terms of features. The game was pretty much the same game as we released on the 3DS, but it just looked almost obscenely fantastic uh, in, uh, in high definition. So it was a good place to start because we managed to get quite a community on, on the 3DS. And once they like you, you really have to fuck up uh, to make them hate you. And it also, if you release something first, it means also that you can sort of develop the game further on other platforms. It means that you're giving something to everybody along the way. The, someone gets it first, and someone gets the best version. And also you need to, when you're thinking about the release order for your game, 
you sort of have to take into consideration that Microsoft is still officially anyway uh, um, implementing this parity clause, meaning that they don't really want games that have been out on similar platforms. If you read between, between the lines, that means don't release on the PS4 before you release it on the Xbox One. They might be moving away from that, which I think is really healthy. <clears throat> but for a good while now, it's, it's been something that you have to sort of take into consideration. So, we've established that we should swim everywhere. And that we should develop, we should just produce golden eggs. And we should put that, those golden eggs, copies of it, in a lot of different baskets. What more can you do to maximize your, your game, so to speak, or your studio? One thing that we're working with now, obviously, at Image and Form, is we're working with the IP SteamWorld. We released SteamWorld Dig in 2013 and 14. Even 2015, the Xbox One version came. But before that, in 2010, for the Nintendo DSi, we released a small game called SteamWorld Tower Defense. As the title implies, it's a tower defense game. And uh, when we released SteamWorld Dig, and SteamWorld Dig got a lot of downloads, suddenly we saw SteamWorld Tower Defense getting quite a few more downloads than it ever had before. Um, and now we're working on SteamWorld Heist. Three very, very different games. Uh, SteamWorld Tower Defense is a tower defense game. SteamWorld Dig is a mining game. SteamWorld Heist is a turn-based strategy shooter game set in space. They can't really be more different, these games. So we're sort of banking on this, that people have decided for themselves that our studio makes decent games, and it's safe to buy our games. And you also develop a liking for these um, steam-driven robots that are the heroes of our games. And so that's what we're trying to do. We're, we want to expand the IP further. But typically, it's very, very easy to get stuck in one game genre. I mean, if you get good at making first-person shooters, odds are that the next game you're going to make is also a first-person shooter, or a platformer, etc. And it's nice to be stuck this way, because everyone in your company has been working on first-person shooters before, so they know exactly how to make that. Or those, they've got the platformer controls really, really down. They know really well how that works. And it's, you know how it is, you sit down in a really, really comfortable armchair and you don't want to get up. You just want to fall asleep and die in that armchair. But dying isn't good for you. So, so it's the thing. It's like you have the same tech. You can reuse it. You have the same community. They know that you can make really good uh, first-person shooters. And so you sort of iterate and reiterate. But it's boring. After a while, you become image and form of the 90s, where we made 25, oh god, 25 edutainment titles. So we knew exactly how to teach kids everything. But I was sort of half expecting, when I walked into my office, finding myself sort of dangling from the ceiling and uh, killing myself from boredom. And it's dangerous because, like, you might lose the people you're working with, but I also think that your customers might get bored with you. It's like, okay, it's more of the same. So what I'm saying is that sequels is not necessarily good. I think someone who is buying, a, let's say, Steam will dig two, it would surprise me if a lot of people, if a lot more people went out and bought Steam will dig two than Steam will dig one, because I work that way anyway. I might be totally old and, and wrong, but um, I think the customer base can sort of can become like a, a negative pyramid of that. And if you're making the same type of games the whole time, you're not really evolving. What happens that day when first-person shooters aren't popular anymore? 
I'm telling you, it's just around the corner. Nobody's going to be playing now. <laughs> it's, uh, I think it's, it's dangerous. So what we're trying to do is we're, going, we're using the same IP over and over. But we're making very, very different types of gameplay the whole time. And it also means that we get to know a lot of stuff. All you need is sort of a good universe for your game. And nice looking characters that have a bit of personality. And then you need a lot of lunch breaks so that you can come up with a lot of gameplay ideas. Obviously, this approach can be really, really dangerous too. Because what if all of the people who loved SteamWorld Dig hate us for taking the franchise in a radically different direction? They wanted SteamWorld Dig 2, not SteamWorld Heist. And there's also a high cost in involved in that. So we're sort of saving a lot of money by taking the game, our games to all the platforms. We're saving money that way, but we're sort of spending money in reinventing the studio by making all types of different games. So it can really be dangerous, but you only live once, right? It's like, if you can take your time to develop every game to perfection, and every game is your game, it's not a Me Too game, nobody made that game before, it means a lot of beautiful things, right? It's like you're gonna, if you manage to pull that off, it's like you're gonna be like just massively popular. You're gonna get laid the whole time. Uh, and also the studio is gonna get so much better. And like there's gonna be so much talk about the studio. It's like what are they possibly thinking up for the next title? What is it gonna be? How different is it gonna be? Or is it gonna be more of the same? It boils down to the legacy, and it's why we're sitting in this room. We're game developers, and we want to develop magnificent games. It's when we retire and look back at what we've sort of wasted all our hours doing. That's when the verdict comes. That's when we decide for ourselves if we made a difference or not. So I think it's really... A, issue of only living once. We can't afford, our lives are too short to sit and make bad games or me too games. Are you with me? Thank you. Thank you for that one applause there. All right. Again, thank you for the beer. Um, the last thing I'm just going to talk about, a little thing, uh, last thing I'm going to talk a little bit about is uh, following, how, do you, how you build it. So getting followers on social media and so on is easy because you can buy them these days. It's very convenient. But money can't buy you love. Even the Beatles knew this, right, in the 60s. So we don't do shit like that, right? I think if you buy, it's like buying hookers. They're not going to love you. Aww. Or are they? Okay. It's not gender specific, of course. I think this is really what it's about. It's this little kid again. This is how you build a loyal following. It's one step at a time. It means. Whenever someone talks to you on social media, you talk back to them. You talk back to them, that sounds rude. You answer them and keep the conversation going. That's what I wanted to say. I'm not going to uh, fantasize about us having the biggest Twitter following, for example, today in the industry, because we don't. But we have a remarkable low uh, what do you call it, churn rate. Our followers don't defollow us. And don't do that now if you follow us, just to prove a point. It's uh, uh, very few do, because we make a point of talking to them 
whenever we can. I think it's really important because one follower means one person with a lot of friends who might not necessarily be on Twitter or follow you, but at one point he or she is going to tell someone that there's this awesome game developer that talked to me today. Because gamers are lonely people. You know this, right? Like, how do we play our games? We sit. Like, I sneak off to the bathroom to, to be alone when I play games. You just say, like, I, I spend a lot more time in the bathroom these days. <laughs> Has nothing to do with age. Maybe not all, of course, right? But couch co-op players are not lonely. But many of them are. And if you talk to them, they, they're going to they're gonna love you for it. It's, it's so simple. And it's so, it's so easy. So never miss an opportunity to talk to someone who wants to talk to you. Journalists are lonely people. Talk to Mike Rose. He's the loneliest guy on the planet. I even had to, to take on a real job to get some friends. No, but some really are. I mean, when you talk to journalists, I mean, you could sort of, you could argue that, that journalists are not so important anymore. I'm not so sure about that. I think exposure, or sort of broadcast media exposure, is really important. And uh, journalists are surprisingly happy to hear from you. So you should just find them and talk to them. And love them. <laughs> now, platform owners like Nintendo, Sony, Microsoft, Valve, uh, Etc. And, and of course Apple and Google, they're not lonely because they're that cool kid in the schoolyard with that huge candy bag, right? Now once that candy bag runs out, they're not, nobody's going to be their friend anymore. We see what happened to the OEA. Yeah. But, uh, but that's, that's the thing. So you, when you talk to platform owners, you sort of need to stand out. Without being snotty or overly cool, make sure that when you talk to platform owners that you have a good story about you and the studio and your games. That sort of sets you apart. It's really important. And streamers, they will never be lonely. Because they are the new... They're the shit these days. I mean, they, like... They're really, really popular. You should really check out your game or, or think about it. Like, is your game streamer, streamer friendly? Will it attract? Um, will it look good on YouTube? Will it look good on Twitch? And also, what is around the corner? The guy who brought me the beer here, Alex from uh, Tiny Build, and uh, Mike, raise your hand there. You should talk to these guys afterwards. Raise it a little bit higher, please. There, Mike. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, yeah. Talk to these guys because they really know how to do this Twitch stuff. We're figuring it out as we go along at Image Inform. They're already there. So I'm, I'm picking their brain as much as I can about that. Um, because it's so important for exposure to be, to be there, to be on YouTube, to be on Twitch. You gotta check it out. Most importantly though, and it goes for everything and everybody you talk to, just be kind to all. Don't be snotty to that crazy kid who loves your games. Like the guy who tweets you five times per day. Just be kind the whole time, okay? It's very, very easy to put on rock star manners and think you're somebody. Just, I think it's, what is that restaurant? Is it uh, Hard Rock, right? Hard Rock Cafe. That have this beautiful little tagline. It just says, love all, serve all. I'm going to try them one day and, and walk in there and throw up and <laughs> just inside the doors just to see if they love me and serve me. But yeah, make, make, make a point of that. Serve everybody. Be fun and be likable and be there. It's like if you miss an opportunity, it might not come back. It can present all kinds of problems, that approach. Because when we released Steamwell Dig on the 3DS in the first place, we released it in, on the same date in, uh, in America, in Europe, and in Australia. 
It meant that I was sleeping in 35-minute bursts or something for the first three weeks. And I almost got divorced and so on. So it's get people to help you do this, but be there. And make sure that you gather people around your games. With SteamWorld Heist, we decided to do something that we hadn't done before. It's not unique, uh, world unique in any way, but we find it works really well. We, we um, put together a program called the SteamWorld Ambassador Program. And what it is, is, uh, so every two weeks we, we come up with a competition or a contest on our site for people to do stuff. Come up with um, new artwork, for example, for the game. Or come up with cool names for st locations in the game, etc. And now the latest one that we had the other day was simply come up with a tagline for SteamWorld Heist. SteamWorld Dig was SteamWorld Dig, a fistful of dirt. SteamWorld Heist, colon, and we have, it works for us. I mean, when we would post something on our blog in the past, we would have maybe, you know, 10, 10 comments or something like that. And you sit there, it's like, God damn it, is there only 10 people liking our game? No, it's like the stuff that we were putting out on our blog was just so uninteresting that people didn't bother. Now, compared to, to these entries, we get many hundreds of entries. In fact, it's almost becoming a logistical problem in the office because someone has to sort of sift through this and decide what, who's the winner. And what the winner gets is something that is very, very simple for us to provide. It's, we promise them codes to every SteamWorld game that ever comes out for life on every platform, plus a few extra codes so they can give out to their friends. Basically making them that popular guy in the schoolyard with a big ba bag of candy, whom everyone is going to hate when that candy runs out, but uh, yeah. So we get, we also get like a lot of great input in the games. And some of it actually makes it into the game. It would be really far-fetched if we told uh, people in the communities that, yeah, whatever you come up with is going to be in the game. It's, I think nobody benefits from that. So there you have it, friends. Thank you. And cheers. Questions? Where's Pony Bar? Is that your question? <laughs> Sorry, say it again. I just need to know where do you have that beer from? You should talk to these guys here. They're the providers. <laughs> right, you talk for an hour and that's the best question? All right. <laughs> Hi, Brian. Hi, Mike. What's your, um, what do you think is your favorite ocean? Mm, yeah, well, that's a very, that's a very good question. It's, mm, I would, if I have to pick one, I would actually pick the Nintendo 3DS community. It sounds like I'm very biased. I noticed during my talk here, I was like, God, I'm really plugging this, right? I'm not being paid by Nintendo to say this, but one of the things about it is that it's, it's good swimming space. It's one of the drawbacks of the 3DS is what makes it so good. It's, it's hard to develop for the platform, which means that there aren't very many games there. So if you can get your game out there, you're going to get a ton more exposure than you would get on mobile, for example, that that sort of goes without saying. But you're you're sort of owning the me the Nintendo 3DS media space for a prolonged time. It's very very good. The other thing is that the community is so diehard. 3DS uh, players, they're vocal and they're loyal. I think it's it's a really good place to be, and I'm glad that not more developers are there, because that means it's all mine for the taking. No, but seriously, I would, if you're, if you're sort of thinking about it, 
you should give it a go. I realize, how many people here are Unity developers, by the way, hand up. And how many are C++ developers? Right, well, like us, we're also a C++ developer, and uh, if nothing else is holding you back, I could really recommend at least porting your games to the Nintendo 3DS. It's hard, and it's, uh, it's a lot of work, but it's really worth it. Right. Oh. So where can you find the Steam community, of the uh, 3DS community? Because where can you find... Yeah, if, if, if I compare it to Steam, it's very easy to find players there. But uh, the 3DS is a bit, like, foggy for me. Yeah, it's... Um... I think it's, um, <clears throat> well, all the users are online on, <clears throat> on Steam, and you can sort of find them there, right? So it's, that's very convenient on Steam. With Nintendo, it, it tends to be forums and, uh, and Nintendo-centric uh, gaming sites. You can, you can quickly build a, a very decent list of, of those forums and those sites, so you can, you can find them. And they will write about your stuff. That's the, that's the immense difference, I think. It's not, it's not that you hope for them to do it. They will actually do it. Right. So I have like I'm question. working at Nintendo. Oh, my Rose. Hi. Um, so why do you think it is that Nintendo keep pushing the Wii U harder than they push the 3DS? Like, why is it if they have this space where people can sell so many copies of games compared to this other platform they've got, they keep trying to flog this horse which isn't going to go any further when they already have a platform which has people like you on it that have proven that it can go way further than that. I think it's a, that's a great question. I, just, before, just before my talk, because I'm, I'm so... Uh, on top of things, I was uh, obviously googling a lot of things here this afternoon. I was, I was reading an article about the Vita that Sony uh, actually hasn't killed the Vita because it's been dead for years. That's, uh, it was a, an IGN article. You have a big difference there. It's like you can, you can liken those two platforms to each other, the Wii U and the Vita, because they, they haven't been successful for the platform owner like the, the PS3 and PS4 are proven successes for Sony, the Vita isn't. And suddenly, like this year at E3, you didn't see any Vita uh, units on display, uh, or at least I couldn't find them. I was probably drunk at the time, but that's, that's what I heard from people as well, that Vita wasn't being shown. And also at Gamescom, I failed to, to find a huge offering of Vita units being, being displayed. So I think where Sony is sort of turning slowly, they are uh, they are now calling it a legacy platform, the Vita, which means that it's it's a platform of the past. It Nintendo has the the same issue with the Wii U. It's it's not a success, and it means that they could they could sort of do it in the same fashion as Sony has done with the Vita. But I think it's not Nintendo's way to do things. It's, um, it's 11 million Wii U units out there. And it's, what did we say, 15 million uh, Xbox One? The gap is going to keep on increasing. Um, it might be reverse psychology. It's like if we keep flogging this, maybe we, we can resurrect it. In my opinion, I think now that Nintendo has announced that they're working on a new platform, um, quite soon we are going to see a reversal on that, meaning that the Wii U is... I don't think they're ever going to come out and say anything remotely like it's, we're not going to support the Wii U. But yeah. With that said, I, I should say that if you're a small studio that are making and you don't need that, <laughs> you don't need that many unit sales, the Wii U is could actually work for you if you're a small enough studio. You could never hope for 
huge sales on, on the Wii U, I think. But uh, it can sustain uh, quite a few different studios, I think. Right, have I bored you enough? Should we find the pony bar? <laughs> Thank you so much.